So today we're going to be talking about next two weeks are my favorite weeks because this is what I long for as a man, as a pastor, and it really helps us to understand that we love what God shows to us and what God is in, in love. And today we're going to be talking about deeper love or mature love. It's important to understand there is a surface love and there is also deeper love. Once we get into deeper love, now you have a level of commitment beyond you can imagine the level of commitment that you have like you begin to understand some things like I understood recently that man I invested my time into this woman I invested my money into this woman I invested my life into this woman I'm not going nowhere I'd rather go all the way with this woman hella how water come my way I'm going all the way so you get that kind of understanding once we switch our idea to go to the deeper waters or deeper love and whenever you read the book of Psalms, of Psalms of uh, Songs of Solomon. This book is written by uh, King Solomon, who was the first, second king of the Israel, third king of the Israel. And uh, Solomon wrote a thousand plus songs. But these songs, the eight songs of this book, are the best of his thousand songs. So every time when people read these songs, every one of us will get a message from the songs because the Holy Spirit put it in a picture that's the allegoric form. So you're not going to like listen to message, maybe that's right. Or you can listen to somebody else bring that message from the songs of Solomon. You believe that may be right. So you have a different vantage points is going to come out of this songs of Solomon. But my focus is my friend, because we're dealing with the marriage and love and spouse and you know husband and wife, I'm more focusing on extracting the knowledge that connects to married life. So if you, if you give the Songs of Solomon to a Jew, when Jew reads that Songs of Solomon, he'll begin to get the picture of a Israel versus God, God loving Israel in that perspective. If you give it to a theologian, the Songs of Solomon, he's going to get the picture of Christ loving the church. But if you give it to a husband to look at the scripture in the context of your wife, now you begin to see your wife in the same book. If you give it this book to a wife, ask, the, ask her to look in the context of the husband, she's going to find her husband. So it's important for us to understand the one book can give us a multiple layers of knowledge as you begin to put your mind to it. The songwriters will extract the songs from this book. The, the, the preachers will extract certain allegoric teaching from this book. It's important for us to kind of bring that out. And, and it's, I've been working on this book for a while, but to me, it is a life-changing to look at it in a different perspective from body of Christ's perspective, from Israel's perspective, from Jewish perspective, and from husband's perspective. So for this series that I'm focusing as a married man, I'm focusing as a husband, I'm not focusing as, as a theologian, even though the scriptures uh, illustrates the theologian's perspective as well. And I want to give you some ground rules. Every time when we look upon God's standard, we begin to bring our standard to God's standard, and we immediately judge ourselves. I want you to know, God is not judging you because what you have done in the past. God always judges you in the context of the truth that you are aware of. God will not judge you the foolishness that you went through. God is not going to judge you pain that you went through. Bible says, Jesus became our judgment. Jesus became our condemnation. Jesus became our shame. Jesus became everything you and I are the past. Now Jesus paid a perfect price for you and I. Now he's going to give you a brand new slate for you to write your future. I want you to know he took care of your past. He's going to give you a new way of leading your life into a future so that your future can be brighter than your past. Your past cannot control your future as long as you know there's a man who took care of your past. Now you can look with the new eyes, new perspective, new way of thinking. My marriage will go better. I know I have not seen last year, but I know this year it will be better than the last year. Yes, my life was broken last year, but this year will be better than the last year. Yes, I made a mistake last year, but I know this year will be better than the last year. Not because who I am, not because what I know, because I know Jesus took care of my yesterday. My tomorrow is so powerful. My my today is greater than yesterday. 
And that's what God wants you to know today. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Because his love is amazing. As we taste that love, we, give, we begin to discover the essence in that love. A man and woman who taste the gospel into that level, you begin to walk in that boldness, confidence. You're not looking your past, you're looking your future. So as we bring this sessions or sermon, please don't compare yourself with your failure. I want you to compare yourself with your success and future because of our Lord Jesus Christ. And today, if you're here first time with us, my name is Philip Sindar, and uh, you know, after this service, we will have a baptism. If you want to be baptized, please do register on the way out so that we will make sure we have everything available for you to get baptized. We have towels, bathrooms, everything you need, so you just come and get baptized, and we, we're going to have one-on-one -on -one class. And if you want to know more about this church, you want to be part of this church, you want to serve in this church, you want to be leader in this church, I welcome you to join us one-on-one -on -one class, and I will teach you who we are and what we are, to whom I'm accountable, and what I do as a pastor, everything I will disclose to you uh, during that one-hour session. After that, we're going to have a baptism. So my thesis for this entire series is found in one, two verses of this book. First Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, Songs of Solomon, chapter 1. Verse 1 to 3, if I have accomplished this particular scripture in you, in your personal life, I believe I have done a job that God called me to do. Number one, Songs of Solomon, he says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. So here, the, the lover or the wife or the girlfriend identifies Something so powerful that we can adapt this principle to apply in our life. He said, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Your love is more delightful than wine. In other words, I've tasted everything. Wine is the thing that the, this world system uses to get intoxicated. The wine, wine is the thing that you just want to drink before your meal and to get like a little bit, you know, mellow and enjoy the moment. But here the Songs of Solomon, it says here, your love is more delightful than wine. What that means is, if somebody comes and talks to you, can they taste that love that you believe in it? Yes, we know we love God. God is love. If we know we love him, we know God loves me. If somebody comes in my territory or they're experiencing the fragrance of the love or, or, or the, the pieces of that love or they're experiencing me, my flesh. So Songs of Solomon says, I want you, all of us, I want you to cultivate this. At the end of this series, if you don't get anything, I want you to get one thing that your love walk is important for God. How you love people, how you love your family, how you love your employer, how you love your employee is important for you to express the God that we believe in. It's important. You know, Bible tells us God is love. Love never fails. The world will go away. The prayer will disappear, but the love will remain forever. God is love. He loves us with an everlasting love. So people may not going to come to faith because we preach the gospel. People will come to faith because we love the people. Because once you love them, they want to know what kind of person you are. And they want to know who, what are you doing as a spirituality so they can, they want to be part of that. That's how the Muslims coming to Christ. That's how the Hindus are coming to Christ. They may not know the theology, but they know the love. Every human being can experience love. Once we express that love, they're going to know God. So the next one he says, pleasing you. The fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like a perfume poured out. No wonder the maidens love you. And it's like she was telling husband, your love is more delightful than wine. But your, 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 your name 
is like a perfume poured out. I don't know if you ever walked into a room who have a perfume. You don't need to come to the, uh, close to that person. But from far distance, you can smell the person. As you're smelling, you may have to gaze around to find who wore that perfume. Because you can't even know who's wearing that perfume until you come close to that person. So he's, uh, the, the wife here telling, I can smell your love. It is so beautiful, awesome. No wonder why every other woman wants you. No wonder why every other man wants you. No wonder why every other mother wants you. No wonder why every other father wants you. Because I can feel, I can feel, I can smell that love that's coming from you. So I want you to be this person. I want you to be the person where the other fathers can follow you to be a father. I want you to be the person where other mothers can follow you to be that mother. I want you to follow where other Christians can follow you to be like that Christians because our love is going out of you. Our love is going out of you. And that's how we got to strive in our life to walk in it. The statistic shows us one out of two marriages end in divorce. That's in the United States of America right now. The divorce rate is equally balanced, both Christians and non-Christians. And I took, you know, uh, uh, permission from the Lord. Lord, this is something is not right. We gotta, we gotta work on this. We gotta labor on this as a Christian people. The first marriage is divorce rate is about forty-one percent. Second marriage divorce rate is sixty percent. The third marriage, divorce rate is 75%. So you're thinking, if I can divorce this man, I'm going to have a better life. If you're thinking, if I can divorce this woman, I can have a better life. The truth is, my friend, you will not have a better life. Now you're going to carry this baggage and you're going to add to other baggage. Now you have a double portion of baggage instead of double portion of the anointing. By the time you deal with the double package of package or the trash that you bring into relationship, whatever the anointing you have, you will lose it. Oh, you all look at me like crazy. <laughs> How many love the truth? Awesome. Then, then I'm talking to you. That's okay. I'm giving you. People say the green other side, the, the, the mountain other side looks so green. But I got to tell you, somebody have to water that. So today, we're going to learn how to deepen our relationship with our spouse. We're going to learn how to deepen our love with, our, with our one another. So Songs of Solomon, if you look at chapter 7 talks about how to deepening love. Like I said, there's a metaphoric. I try my best to bring it to your place where you can understand. And if you, if you hear anything else uh, uh, from the sermon that God is speaking to you, a rhema word, as I'm giving you logos, he speaks to you rhema word. Rhema word is something that God will breathe on that and you catch it like, oh, this is for me. You know, even though I bring the logos and God will give you rhema, sometimes rhema may come out of my mouth and you just need to catch it and see if you can apply that. So here, the friends and songs of Solomon, as friends of songs of Solomon and Solomon, he says, how beautiful your sandal feet. Do you remember when he first dating her, when he came to uh, uh, looking at her, he did not start off from the bottom. He started off from the top down. How many remember that, right? He started off like your hair is like the goats of the mountain and your eyes are this and he went from here top to down here but now chapter 7 he's reversing the idea of this woman in a whole new perspective he said how beautiful your sandal feet you know feet normally they're not an attractive part of our body most of the times so I don't know about your feet but you know I'm looking at my feet I say it's not the most attractive thing yes God gave us a feet for the purpose of utility purpose that you want to carry your body point A to point B. You know, most likely that's what we do. We run, we walk, you know, we stand, we put a balance on it. But here, this man looks at the feet of the woman and he says, oh princess daughter, your graceful legs are like a jewels and, and the work of your, uh, of a craftsman's hand. So he goes on to say that your feet are, are, are beautiful. You know, he looks at her walk 
was beautiful. How many of us know you can look at your wife and the way she carries herself in the public, the way she carries herself in the private area, the way she carries herself with her father, the way she carries herself with her mother, friends, and you begin to observe as a husband, you can't help it to see, man, my wife is beautiful in the actuality, the things that she does for other people. And he goes on to call her, oh, princess daughter. How many of us know we have a prince, he's called the prince of peace. When he looks upon her, when he calls her a prince or daughter, he's identifying that you're a woman of peace. And how many of you would like to know, every man would like to marry and live with a person who is peace. No man would stay with a woman that's a conflict that's creating a trouble in their life, in other people's life. No man would like to have a peace with a woman who's creating a drama, but a man likes to live with a woman who creates a peace. And he calls her a princess daughter. That means you know how to tap into peace. That means you know how to connect to the flow of peace. That means you know in the middle of the trouble, you know how to bring it together. In the middle of the conflict, you know how to keep it together. You're not complaining about people. You're bringing yourself in a subjection to God who can keep everything in order, who can enable everything that's not of you. And that woman understood. Woman, if you don't know how to keep in peace, ask God. He has given you the fruit of your spirit is peace. It's okay to ask, Lord, give me peace. But I want to encourage you to pray like this. Lord, help me to see the peace that's inside of me. Then you can walk in it. Because every man will love a woman of peace. Can I hear an amen from man? All right. <laughs> you know, have you ever noticed that you're in the middle of your wife picks a fight? You're just looking for a car keys. What does that mean? That tells you that man does not want to be in the living room or bathroom or kitchen, wherever you're creating conflict. But as soon as you open and create a peace, that man will come out of everything and look at her and it's like, I enjoy this marriage. I love this marriage. And he goes on to say, your legs are like jewels. And when I, when I study the word legs, so the same word is called the joint that connects from your stomach and your leg. Because it's not a beautiful place. And even when he's comparing, he's comparing the woman's shape like a jewel. Because it's, it's like a jewel that's shaped. But essence, the truth or there is like the thigh, the hollow of the thigh. And when I was doing that, and I begin to remember the word of God, the that was given in the book of Genesis when Jacob was rustling with God, angel of the Lord touched the thigh of, a, of Jacob. Immediately, Jacob found the place to surrender. And when he's looking at her, he's telling her, you know how to find your place of surrender to your husband. A woman that surrenders her husband, irrespective of conflict, irrespective of all the debate that you can go in, that woman understands and understood God's nature that's working within her. It's easy to surrender to a, to a president of the United States of America. It's conflict. It's hard. It requires faith to surrender when your husband acting crazy, when your husband talking to back to you, when your husband being a foolish. It's very hard to surrender. But God of peace, God of faith, who will enable you to surrender to something that you cannot handle, and God will come into that marriage and bring peace because of your peace. Because you surrender. Because it's the right thing to do. The standard, the world standard says, if he's yelling and screaming, get out of the marriage. But Bible teaches us, when you do all you need to know, then God can step in and revive that marriage. God will help that marriage. And he goes on to, go, he goes on to say, next words, your, your, your navel is rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Your waist is mound of wheat encircled by lilies. 
And it's important that, that when you look at that, the navel is the belly button top under, below belly button. It's comparing the portion of her belly, her belly button. And he's saying that I appreciate everything that I see spiritually, not only naturally. Everything that God created us, our bodies, they have a spiritual connotation to it. And he's looking beyond the natural. He's looking at that. Man, it, it, feels like I can see encircled by lilies. And lilies are the, 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 the beautiful uh, flowers that blossom in the valley. In a valley, when you go through a tough moment, that's when you really begin to look upon the things that you don't want to look upon. You begin to investigate your heart because you're in a difficult situation. He's comparing this woman, because of you, my love, because of you, my wife, you are teaching me the deeper things of my valley. When I go to the valley, when I look upon you, you are the one talking to me. You are the one helping me to come out of the valley. And Bible says Jesus is all also, lilies of valley. And he sees that. Have you ever noticed that you're talking to your wife, but you're thinking about you? Have you ever noticed you're talking to your husband, but you're thinking about you? We're not thinking about them. We're most thinking about us as we're talking. So God uses our spouse to lead us valleys, to help our faith walk right, to help our manhood right, to help our womanhood right, to help us make us wife. It's important, every woman is not wife. Every man is not a husband. Husbands are need to be taught. A woman needs to be turned into wife. You know, we need to be taught because we don't know. As soon as we get married, we think we become wife. No, wife is a, a role that God created with the responsibilities on the shoulder, with the effectiveness on the shoulder. You're not just a woman now. You're a wife with a, with a husband that God gave you. Now you're going to walk into that kind of direction. You're going to mold your life. Yes, some things you don't like it. Yes, some things you may not going to agree with it. But it's your time because you made a covenant with this man. Now you're going to mold according to your husband and bring yourself into that place where God is calling me it's not about my past, it's not about my parents, it's about me and my husband going in the future, what God is calling us and now you mold your life into that way same thing with the husband, once you get married does that, that doesn't make you husband Husband is something else. You gotta adapt the culture. You gotta know the culture. Me and my wife, can you come here, sweet? Let me let everybody see. You, when you see my wife, and you know, if this marriage is working, you better bet yourself like that. This every marriage should work. Come here. Let's give her a big hand clap. <laughs> my wife is Hispanic. I'm Indian. And you know, there's two different languages here. Two different cultures are here. Two different ideologies here. We learned last 10 years, work together to become the team. It's not about me being an Indian. It's not about she being a Latina. It's about we being one. It's about we one connecting. Yes, I was a man. Now God molded me to be the husband. Yes, she was a woman. God molded her to be a wife. It takes time. It takes a lifetime. That's why after 40, 50 years of your marriage, you really begin to know who you married to. I lost you some y'all. You think you figured it out in two years. No, you don't. You probably start smelling that time. That's it. But it takes a lifetime. Do you want to say something? Let me give her a microphone if anybody has a... Can, somebody can run and give me a microphone for her. So, she did not know I was going to call her. She, my wife is one of the person keep me behind the scenes. I don't want to. Be <laughs> but I surprise her on the spot so that if God puts her in her heart to say something, she can also say But it, it, it takes a commitment. It takes life of molding one another to become what God has called us to be. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's been a good ride with Pastor. When I first, uh, when we first met, we were co-workers, and there's a lot that we overcame as man and woman to walk into uh, a relationship, go past the work, area, but I can tell you today, 10 years later, that I know that he loves me. 
I know that this man was created for me and that we have a destiny together and that it's a, it's a joy. It's a joyful walk as we discover each other. It's sometimes like a roller coaster, but it's been fun. Sometimes you just have to throw your hands up in the air and take that turn and take that twist and you go upside down. But at the end of the day, it's a beautiful ride. And uh, it's just been a joy. Man, thank you, sir. Let's give her a big hand clap. Thank you so much. So Solomon found that as he's looking at this woman, he began to see what God has been doing. So I call point number one, I call this Solomon leading his life into deeper appreciation. In order for you to go deeper in love with your spouse, you got to learn to appreciate the person that God has given to you. Don't compare that person with the other person. Don't try to make that person other person. Don't try to bring that person into a place where what you believe that person supposed to be. It is important for us to learn from God's word and deeper appreciation. Appreciate what she is, what she has, what she can offer. I've learned so many times that I immediately catch myself when I go through the tunnel where I begin to compare my wife. I have to catch myself. No, that's not the woman that I married. I don't want that woman. I don't want to compare my wife to anyone. I want to I wanna learn of her. I want to discover her. I want to see what, what God has invested in her. I want to extract the treasure that's inside of her. I want to pull the thing that's inside. That that's the person I married. I didn't marry so and so so I can look so and so in her. No, I married Diana Sundar so I can believe Diana Sundar. I can extract Diana Sundar. I can walk with the Diana Sundar. Your life will be meaningful when you find that out. In other words, you're sleeping with the woman but you're dreaming somebody else. And it's important for us to see that. So that God can mold our life. And next verse, he goes on to say, your neck is like an ivory. Ivory is a stone that they use it to, to bring in a, in a beautiful ornaments. You know, it's one thing about in Eastern culture that we have that God created spirituality through shadows, through colors, through art. And if you go to Europe, Europe countries or even Middle Eastern countries, you see the buildings that they have a beautiful architecture that you don't find that often in the United States in the culture that we're living in right now, that we don't even embrace the art. But I learned something about God. Because God is spirit, he has a way to communicate people through shadows, through patterns, through the art, through the symbolism. So here he says, your neck is like an ivory. Ivory is a stone that goes through a process of death in order for the ivory to become shiny stone. So this stone went through a process of death. That tells me that as a husband, as a wife, in order for you to see your spouse clearly, you must first die. I'm not talking about physical death, emotional death. I'm talking about death that you believed in some things. Death that you have a speculation about something. A person, Bible says, if we pick up your cross and follow Jesus Christ, that is the act of death. i confessing that I died with him when he died on the cross. I'm confessing that my old nature is dead when Jesus was dead on the cross. Now I'm putting on a new nature, which is the Christ Jesus. Now I'm following that person because I confess that I dead man. And here, in order for you to see your wife pure, clean, holy, it says you got to die spiritually. Die in order for you to, you know, to see that beauty that God created. So he calls your neck is like an ivory tower. Your eyes are the pools of a hashborn by the gate of Beth Rahim. Beam. And this is place where almost like 25 miles away from Jordan River, there is a pool. And this pool has a, such a significance to it that they built this pool with the ancient hands. And they, they curve every stone very strategically. So the waters that connected to a living uh, river, it's coming into this pool as a pure as a cluster clear. When you taste that water, you'll be surprised. Man, I have never tasted the water so 
clear, so pure. And that tells us he's comparing her with that kind of pure water. So it's so crystal clear, it indicates it requires years of work digging into that marriage. In order for you to see that pure waters that you've been looking, the deep waters that's in that woman, deep waters in that man, you got to work your way into it and build your relationship with the person, digging what the wounds that you've been seeing, digging what pains that she went through, digging what kind of disappointment that man went through, digging what kind of failure that man went through. Instead of walking away from the person, we got to learn to be a diggers. When we keep digging with your faith, with your prayer, with your believing that person that God put you together, then you arrive into this place called Pools of Hashbon. One thing I learned about Pools of Hashbon, the waters when they don't move, they look like a mirror. Have you ever looked into a water that's moving? Your face is going this way. Your face is going. And you're like, you're trying to see, but you can't see. Your eyes go green. But have you ever find yourself looking at a water that did not move silent? You can look at it. You can gaze at it. You can identify yourself. She reveals who I am inside. I reveal who she's inside. We marry a person who we are inside. Sometimes it takes a lifetime to discover that. Only God could reveal that. Enemy puts a lot of stumbling blocks before you go into this pool of Heshbon. The day you arrive, the day you gaze that woman and you see yourself, you're tapping in something. It is so awesome. He goes on to say, your eyes. When I look at Jewish people, when they call the eye, they call it soul. I can look into a soul and you can see what's inside of the soul. And he said, I see your eyes like the pools of Heshbon. I'm about to discover you. I'm about to discover me in you. I'm about to see me in you. And he says, huh? and the next one, he says, your nose is the tower of Lebanon looking towards Damascus. It's interesting that how he compares each item. That he says, your hair is this, your eyes are this, your nose is this. And he's not talking about us to duplicate in calling our spouse like that. He's, he's asking us to look beyond what you married to. Look beyond the person that you married to. And he says, you know, your nose is like a tower of Lebanon looking towards. That means the honor and strength. Lebanon is still existing in the map. Lebanon, things that came, the spices that come from Lebanon has almost four or 5,000 years of history. That means it's a long term. It's a long strength that, that represents how much strength you have in that relationship, the strength. And that leads us, point number two that I will, I'm bringing here is deeper need. You begin to depend on your spouse. I, I know I talk to my wife all the time. She's doing her master's. You know, Sunday she, she does her homework. And I like Sundays after church, go home. I need her Sundays. I don't want her. I need her. I just go home. I love spending time with her because it just, re, it just like a refreshes me. I feel so energized. And every time when she does homework, I'm like sitting in my office like, I don't like this Sunday. Even though I had a great time in the morning preaching, but the afternoon, I just I just need her because I learned, I discovered something. My needs are met in her alone. And I need her not because the sexual content, but I need her because I, I have a person that lives with me and I have invested my time in my life. And it really brings a celebration when I spend my time with her. Are you, are you cultivating that? Are you looking that need to be fulfilled in your wife or somewhere else? It's important for us to know. And then he goes on to say, your head crowns you like a Mount Carmel. He compares the head, is crowns you Mount Carmel. I don't know, you remember when I look at Mount Carmel, that's where Elijah 
called all the 50 prophets and he said, call upon your God and I'm going to, 500, I'm sorry, 500 prophets, call upon your God, Baal, and see what he can do. And they called all day and the Baal did not respond to them. And, and Elijah said, now it's my turn. Let me call the God of Israel. And when he called the God of Israel on a wet, on a wet uh, uh, wood, the fire of God came from heaven and lit the sacrifice and begin to expose every ungodliness through that Mount Carmel. And that he's telling her, you're a woman that can expose anything that's not of God. You're a woman that can call upon God on my life. You're a woman that praying for me when I don't know how to pray for me. You're a woman that declaring my future when I am believing for me. So he's telling you're a woman of God's prophet. And he says, you're here. Your head crowns you like. How many women are declaring, prophesying your husband when he's sleeping? We, we, com- we complain about your husband. When, he, when he's not home, are you taking that pillow? Are you declaring every sickness in this pillow will die in Jesus' name? Are you saying that if my husband watches a porn, he will be exposed and bend their knees before Christ? Are you telling pillow, you are the warrior of Jesus Christ? You will go before God. You are a champion. You're not a weak man. You're a God's man. I will declare over you, pillow. Are you talking to your pillow or are we complaining about our husbands same thing husbands are you praying or your husband are you laying your hand and say I bless you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ or are you giving her to somebody else it's important he says look at that your head because he understood what that head means your head crowns like a Mount Carmel I encourage you, my friend, if you're married, cultivate that. Pray with her. Lay your hand on her. You declare God's blessing over her. You say you're beautiful inside out. It doesn't matter what man says, but I say as a husband, my darling, you are beautiful inside out. You will live for us. You will glow for us. You will glorify King of Kings. Speak that life into them. Prophesy it. And he says, your hair is like a royal tapestry. It's a complex combination of things or sequence. If you look at a woman's hair, woman's hair can mold into different shapes. I was looking at a man, one day you can have long hair. Another day you can roll that up and put a ting thing. And another day, another day you can roll those things side and look pretty. Now, according to the dress, they can maneuver their hair. They're intelligent being God created. They take their hair and bring a life to it. When you get up morning and you say something, and by 10.30 you'll see some another woman. It's just a pretty rest comes. It's an awesome thing that they can do with the hair. I'm not talking about you, Lenny, but... You know, they can, they, they can do that awesome thing they can, they can do with that hair. And it, it is the combination that he identifies something as she's putting her hair, as she's doing her hair. He's not thinking about the outer appearance. He's thinking about you're a woman who can unpack the uh, conflict so easily. You're a woman that you can bring the sequence of events to organize life right way. You know how to take something messy, bring beauty. You know how to take something drama, bring life. In it. You know how to take something nobody wants it but make it wanted you know it and he saw that woman I want to encourage you woman if you know how to put your hair right God has given you a gift to take a mess and make a message out of a mess you have that inside of you I pray that you will grow into spirituality to become a woman that God is describing. He says the king, I love this last one. He says the king is held captive by its tresses. The way you unpack the conflicts, I am arrested into that peace. The way you resolve the conflict, I am captivated into that peace. King, he says, uh, yes, I come home. You create the atmosphere that makes me surrender. He became a captive. And you want a husband? Learn these things before you find a husband. If you want a wife, learn these things before you. You know, just just because your emotions crave at you, I need a husband. Are you a wife yet? 
It's one thing to have a feeling, another thing to have a future. You can have a feeling. Feeling can come and go. But the future is what you're going to create that with that man. Future is what you're going to create with that woman. And you're going to prepare for a long haul, my friend. Not for a night, a long haul. And that tells us that he learned how to respect. I call it deeper respect. Cultivating deeper respect with that woman. And, and it, it really blesses you to see that. And he goes on to say, seven, uh, what's chapter 7, 6, and 8. And here is how beautiful you are, how pleasing, O love, with your delights. Your stature or your stature is like that of the palm. And your breasts are a cluster of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take a hold of its fruit. May your breast be like a cluster of the wine. The fragrance of your breath like apples. And your mouth like the best wine. Exactly what you think he's saying there. Even after a long time relationship, he cultivated intimacy with this woman. He trained his heart, his mind to see her intimate. And he, he embraced this, this allegoric way. The palm trees, everybody enjoys the palm trees. When you go by the beach, you see these palm trees. The one thing that I learn about palm trees, palm trees stand strong during every storm that's going to come their way. They're not afraid of the storm. That's why they stand close to storm. They're not afraid of the waves that are coming. Have you ever seen the palm trees go bend this way or that way? When the storm comes and gone, the palm tree still says, I'm still here. And he sees her. He sees her that I can trust you. You're trustworthy. I make you. I can look myself, the trust in you. I believe you, whether you're talking to so-and-so, I believe you if you're talking to young man, old man, because I know your heart. I know your root. I know who you are. We live in a culture, husband always checking on their wife. Wonder what she's doing there. Wonder what she's talking there. And you were, you're a wife, you're always checking on your husband. Who is he talking to? Who is he? You're not cultivated trust yet. Because once you trust that person, that person will not go nowhere. That person is married to you. I know we're living in a culture, there's a corruption everywhere. But we need to bring God's standard in our marriage so that you can have that kind of trust in your life, in your wife's life, so you can have that thing. And I like another thing. He says, I will climb the palm tree. In, in a Florida, they have a law that you're not supposed to, you know, they have these uh, spikes in the shoe. When they climb the palm tree, they put the spikes. As they're climbing up, they're hurting the tree. How many times we do that? As you're climbing up on your spouse, you're hurting the tree. So they put the law, you know, that you're not supposed to have the spikes and kill the tree and then climb. And in the old ways that I came from India, and the guys, their spikes, they have a small uh, kind of a ribbon they put in, the, in their ankles. And then they have a big, you know, a wheel kind of rubber they put on their waist. So what they do is they gently put that uh, bigger uh, rope on, on the tree and they hug the tree. And then they bring the lift up, this two feet up, and lock it. And then he takes again this one to go to the next phase and to hug the tree and pull himself. And it's important for us to know that as you're embracing your spouse, as you're embracing her ideology, her failures, her weakness, her, her, her imperfections, and, as, and then you can climb on the tree. Then she can surrender to you. Then she can bring yourself into you. Look at how he describes that I will climb the tree. I will take a hold of its fruit. Husbands, I want to give you a piece of counsel. You're investing your future into that woman. Don't walk away. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. You're investing your life, your future in it. Learn, ask God to give you that God will give you the understanding to cultivate something and it's awesome the fourth one that i want to give you that is deeper intimacy cultivate intimacy that is godly not that's earthly godly so god can bring a fruit that you alone can taste and i tell my wife you're you're beautiful she's like she kind of chuckle i said i don't think you see what i see sweetie you're beautiful you're awesome you're perfect that woman blows my head 
When she put something together, I, w- I would say twice, whoa, where are you coming from? I have to investigate her. Where are you getting this knowledge? One day she, I was writing something and then she came and helped me to put something together. I said, oh, whatever I'm thinking, she put it on the letter. And I'm thinking, man, what I feel, she can bring it on her fingers. I said, I've never seen a miracle like that. I looked at her and I said, sweetheart, you are perfect. What I feel, you are articulating through your fingers. And I look at those fingers, kiss them, my man, they're so awesome. Your destiny is in your spouse. If you learn to unlock that, you go into places that you never dreamed. Your destiny is in there. God invested that kind of measure of destiny in your spouse. There's a saying in India, maybe here too, on every successful man, there's a woman behind it. And I believe that till today. The reason I'm here, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because my wife who cultivated the relationship that I am allowing her and I'm enabling her. And she talks at the end of this chapter, Psalms of Solomon, verse 7, 9 to 12. I'm done, I'm, I'm bringing this together. She says here, may the wine go straight to my beloved. She said, all this your adoration, Solomon, everything you talked about me, Solomon, all this you think is God created this for me? No, the neck, the eyes, the air. Uh, the, 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 the beauty, my breast, everything. He says, may this wine go straight to my beloved. To whom are you giving that? God made you a person for one person so that you can give that. And flowing gently over lips and teeth. That's beautiful to know that she learned how to articulate very gently, very feminine way that can captivate that king in their marriage. I underline the last two verses. This is the purpose why God made you my wife. He says, I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. If wives will understand this, you have a beautiful marriage. God did not create, God did not make, God did not make you a wife for somebody else. He made you a wife for that husband. Only. Let me say it again. Only. Not for the business, not for the ministry. Yes, ministry is good, business is good, but you did not marry a ministry or business, you married that husband. And he says here, I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. That's what I made for. Do you know, Eve came from Adam. Adam was initially both male and female. Because God saw, Adam, you should not be alone to to have a life and see what you are inside. So he took women from inside of that man and bring it out so he can see who is inside of him. And he married that woman. And that woman is called Counselor, comforter. Her destiny is Adam. Her destiny is not her children. Her destiny is Adam. Children you gave birth will be with you and will be gone. But your husband is my woman, will be with you forever. And it's important for you to acknowledge the truth and invest into the spouse. God gave you 12 hours a day. How much time are you taking to at least acknowledge the reality that God put? Are you been complaining 12 hours? Are you taking at least one hour to talk about highly your husband or your wife? Are you just talking about, I wish I could have married somebody else. I wish I could have done better. No, stop complaining. Quit complaining. Ask God to reveal to that person. Ask God to show you that person so you can look upon the good things about that person. Then you will come out of that death and see God is walking in you. Says my, I belong to my beloved. I don't belong to nobody. I have a passion for this because I I also identify this way. I don't belong to nobody but Jesus Christ. I take it very seriously in my core of my being. 
I'm not an Indian first. I'm a first Christian. Then I'm Indian. I'm not American first. No, I'm first a Christian. Then I'm American. Our relationship with God. I live for Him. I die for Him. That's who we are, Christians. He put us here. He chose you before the foundation of the earth for the kingdom of God. I belong to my beloved. His desire is for me. Do you know, God said, He put a desire in us to seek Him. His desire is for Him. If you can bow your heads, I'm done. And I know before I'm going to pray for you, I want to ask you something. If you're here, you're married or you're about to get married or you're going to find a spouse to get married. And if you want me to pray for your marriage, if you want me to pray for your future relationship, if you want me to acknowledge in the prayer that I'm going to lift before the Lord for your marriage or for your past or future, whatever, I want you to lift your hands and let me see so I can remember your face. Thank you. I can see. Thank you. I can see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. You can put those hands down. Father, I lift this marriage. Not only the ones that lifted their hands, but everyone that have a desire to bring their marriage according to your standard. We lift that marriage to you, God. You put us together, Lord. You put this marriage together for your own purpose, for your own glory. Even though we enjoy the fruit, but there is a spiritual benefit that you have for this. I pray that your divine blessings rest upon every marriage in CJC life in this room and that are watching online. And we thank you, God, for bringing them into a a place of trust, a place of deeper love for one another. We pray that you will elevate them to be a model in this society that's been ungodly and following God. We thank you, God, creating a culture in CJC life that the divorce rate will go down in Jesus' name. That this church will rise up with a married couple, trusting one another, growing for one another. I pray blessings over them. We pray blessings for the glory of God to rest upon. In Jesus' name, we pray. If you're here, If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, before you even understand what God has for you, you have to make sure that you know Jesus personally for your own self. If you do not know, I'm here to pray with you, pray for you. And you say, I'm ready to recommit my life. I'm ready to surrender to Him because I believe in Him. I trust on Him. I need His presence in my life. I love the Lord. I need Jesus. If you're ready, my friend, you can whisper these words. You can pray these words. But as long as you feel sincere in your heart, God counts you as His own son and daughter today. And if you want me to pray, If you want to lead your life into the Lord, if you can lift your hands and I can see, I want to pray for you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I see that. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Put those hands down. Just say out loud, Lord Jesus, I am sorry. Forgive all my mistakes. Come into my heart. Lead me, Lord, in truth and righteousness. Help me to be that person that you called me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me from me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap. You did a great job. I appreciate it. Thank you for letting me talk to you the way the Spirit of God is downloading in me. We're going to have a prayer team. Join us every first Thursday at 7 p.m. for our monthly communion service. If you want to experience the amazing power of God, His healing touch, and life-giving biblical insight, come join us every first Thursday at 7 p.m. for a more intimate encounter of His presence 
an opportunity to remember, celebrate, and partake of His love for us.